In the last video, we introduced and went over the Einstein field equations, which govern the relationship between the curvature of the four-dimensional space-time hypersurface on one side and the distribution of mass and energy on the other side. In this video, we're going to start solving the Einstein field equations for one of the simplest space-time configurations to end up with the Schwarzschild solution. Let me start by stating the Einstein field equations, which consist of the Ricci tensor on the left minus half the Ricci scalar times the metric tensor plus the cosmological constant times the metric tensor. And on the right hand side you have your 8 pi g over c to the power 4 times the stress energy momentum tensor t. Of course, for every tensor quantity in this equation, I'm writing the subscripts mu and nu to denote the fact that these are the components of that tensor quantity we're talking about. In the last video, we also discussed two ways of solving the Einstein field equations. The first way is to assume a mass energy distribution, the tensor T, and solve for the corresponding spacetime geometry, so your metric tensor. The second way is to assume a spacetime geometry and solve for the corresponding mass energy distribution. In this video, we're going to use the first way and assume a particular mass energy distribution and solve for G, and that's how we're going to get the Schwarzschild solution. But before we begin solving for the Schwarzschild solution, we need to formulate the problem and put forward our assumptions. The problem we're dealing with is as follows. Suppose I have a static, uncharged, non-rotating spherical mass m with no other sources of mass or energy around it. Let me state the assumptions explicitly. The first is that we're only worried about the space-time geometry outside the spherical mass. So we're only worried about the space-time geometry in the surrounding vacuum. Now, in that surrounding vacuum, there is no mass or energy, meaning that the stress-energy-momentum tensor is zero. Inside the mass, sure, there's mass and pressure, meaning the stress-energy tensor won't be zero, but outside the mass, it will be zero. By the way, making this assumption means that we're going for the exterior Schwarzschild solution. The second assumption we'll make is that there's no vacuum energy. What do I mean by this? Well, it means that for this particular situation, for Schwarzschild geometry, we ignore the accelerated expansion of the universe and set our cosmological constant to zero. The cosmological constant is the quantity in the Einstein field equations that describes vacuum energy, and it's also closely related to dark energy, so we're just going to set that to zero here. The third assumption we'll make is that the space-time geometry solution, the metric tensor solution, is Lorentzian. What does that mean? Well, it means that the metric signature, the signs of the diagonal components of the metric tensor G, are negative 1 for the time component and positive 1 for the three spatial components. Now, why do we make this assumption? Well, if we've got a massive sphere in the middle of our space-time surface, then very far away from that sphere, we would be in a region of zero or close to zero space-time curvature. So when we get further from the spherical mass, our metric tensor should approach the metric tensor of flat space-time, of a zero curvature, zero gravity space-time. And what is the metric tensor of flat space-time? The Minkowski metric. So as we get further from the sphere, the value of the metric tensor gets closer and closer to that of the Minkowski metric. Since the Minkowski metric is represented by this diagonal matrix, with the first element being negative 1 and the other three elements being positive 1, that means the general metric tensor solution for the Schwarzschild problem should also have similar signs for its diagonal components. And that's why we'll pick this as our default sign convention for really all our metric tensor solutions to the Einstein field equations. Now you can still have the signs of the diagonal components change, but they would have to change in a smooth continuous manner, which is what happens at the event horizon for the Schwarzschild solution. But you can't have random patches of the space-time surface with different signs on the diagonal components of the metric, because that would introduce jump discontinuities which are unphysical. We'll talk about the event horizon later on once we've derived our Schwarzschild solution, so don't worry if you don't know what that is right now. The fourth assumption we'll make is that of spherical symmetry. I'll show you what this means. Let me draw a non-rotating sphere here in the middle, and let me draw a point outside the sphere out here. This point A has a radial coordinate r, an azimuthal angle theta, so the angle from the positive x-axis, and a polar angle phi, so the angle from the positive z-axis. If I draw another point with the same coordinates but a theta angle that's flipped to negative theta, that point is going to be somewhere here. I'll label this point B. I'll draw a third point C as well with the same coordinates as A, but now the polar angle phi is flipped. What spherical symmetry means is that the value of the metric tensor should not change as we go from A to B and as we go from A to C, or even B to C for that matter. And finally, 
The fifth assumption we'll make is that space-time is static, meaning that the metric tensor components do not depend on time. This makes sense because we're just describing the space-time geometry around a sphere that's just sitting around. It's not moving, it's not going anywhere, so there's no reason for the space-time geometry around that sphere to depend on time. We'll see in a later video that we can somewhat relax this assumption via Birkhoff's theorem, but I'll get to that later. For now, I'll assume a static metric tensor solution. We now have two tasks remaining for the introductory part in deriving the Schwarzschild metric. The first task is to use assumptions 1 and 2 to simplify the Einstein field equations for our specific problem, and the second task is to use assumptions 3 to 5 to come up with a hypothesized metric tensor solution, also known as an ansatz, that will be the general form of the solution to the Einstein field equations for the Schwarzschild problem. Let's start with task 1 by copy-pasting our Einstein field equations here. By assumption 1, the stress-energy tensor on the right is 0, and by assumption 2, the cosmological constant term is 0, so we'll cancel those out and be left with the following for the Einstein field equations. I'll call this equation 1. Let's now multiply both sides by the inverse metric tensor, so g super mu nu, and then sum over mu and nu. When we do that, this is what we get. We haven't put in the summation symbols here because we're using Einstein notation, so indices that are repeated twice are automatically summed over. In this case, they're summed from 0 to 3 because we're working in four dimensions. Now this first term on the left is just the Ricci scalar by definition. When you actually multiply the components of the inverse metric tensor with the corresponding components of the Ricci tensor, and then sum all of those components, because the indices are repeated twice, you basically get the trace of the Ricci tensor with respect to G, which is just the Ricci scalar. Meanwhile, the second term on the left, the inverse metric times the metric, is just the Kronecker delta symbol summed over the index mu from 0 to 3. Since the Kronecker delta symbol has the same superscript and subscript, it doesn't just reduce to 1, it becomes 4 because we're basically taking the trace, the sum of diagonal elements of a 4x4 four four identity matrix. So now when we plug these things in, we get r minus half of 4 times r equals 0, so r minus 2r is 0, which means that the Ricci scalar is just 0. If we now plug this into equation 1, the second term on the left goes away because the Ricci scalar is 0, and so we're left with the Ricci tensor components all being equal to 0. I'll call this equation 2. Now this equation, or more accurately equations, have a special name. They're called the vacuum Einstein field equations. It's not a single equation because you need to equate all the components of the Ricci tensor to zero. It's a system of equations for each Ricci tensor component. So we've completed task one and found the simplified Einstein field equations we need to solve to get our Schwarzschild solution. Let's now start with task two and develop the ansatz, the educated guess, for our Schwarzschild solution. I'll start by using assumptions 4 and 5 to show that the Schwarzschild metric must be diagonal. We'll suppose that our default time, radial, and angular coordinates are represented by the x super i coordinate system. We'll also suppose that our transformed coordinates where we go from positive theta to negative theta are represented by the x super i bar coordinate system, like so. The relationships between all the barred coordinates and the unbarred coordinates are summarized as follows. Now, because the metric tensor is a covariant tensor of rank 2, the transformed component g mu nu bar in the new coordinate system would be related to the unbarred components by the following equation, the following transformation law. Now, if we consider the mu comma 2 component of the transform metric tensor, so the mu is a free index but the 2 is a fixed index representing the theta component, this is what our transformation law becomes, where I just substituted the nu as 2. The indices a and b on the right are being summed over, but the only time these partial derivatives are non-zero is when a and mu represent the same index. The reason for this is our coordinate transformation equations up here, they only relate the barred coordinates to their corresponding unbarred coordinates, and not any other coordinates. So x super 1 bar is only related to x super 1, and not to any other coordinate like x super 3 for instance. This means that this first partial derivative is 1, as long as mu isn't also 2, because then it would be negative 1. Meanwhile, the second partial derivative can only be negative 1 if b is 2, otherwise it's 0. So therefore, in terms of the original g sub mu comma 2, the corresponding transform metric tensor component is just the negative of the original, as long as mu isn't 2. But this coordinate transformation where we just flipped one of the angles shouldn't actually change that metric tensor component. 
the metric tensor at the flipped angle should still be the same because of spherical symmetry, so this mu2 component is the same between coordinate transformations, but it's also negative between coordinate transformations, so the only possibility is that this metric tensor component, the g sub mu2, is zero if mu is not equal to two. By a similar logic, you could also consider a coordinate transformation where we flip the sine of phi. In that case, as long as mu is in 3, the metric tensor component g sub mu 3 is also 0 because of spherical symmetry. And finally, because the metric is static with time by assumption 5, if we consider the coordinate transformation where we flip the sine of t, then as long as mu isn't 0, we can show that the metric tensor component g sub mu 0 is also 0 because of the static nature of the problem. Hopefully these last few lines weren't too hard to follow, but if they are, I encourage you to go over the algebra again just in case you're confused, and to ask any questions in the comments if the confusion persists. So anyway, because of these three conclusions, which basically say that the off-diagonal components of the metric are all zero, we can conclude that the only non-zero components are the diagonal components, so the metric is represented by a diagonal matrix. But what do these diagonal components look like? Well, suppose that I'm at a location in space-time with a fixed t and a fixed r coordinate. If my t and r are fixed, then again, because of the spherically symmetric nature of the problem, the line element represented by the metric tensor should be the exact same as the line element of a sphere of a fixed radius. This means that when dr and dt are zero, so t and r are basically fixed, the line element ds squared should equal the following, which is just the line element of a sphere. So the 2, 2 component of the Schwarzschild metric is r squared sine squared phi, and the 3, 3 component is just r squared. But what about the last two diagonal elements, the 0, 0 component and the 1, 1 component? Well, again, by the spherical symmetry of the problem, these components are, in general, functions of only r. They don't depend on t because it's a static problem because of assumption 5, and they also don't depend on theta and phi because of spherical symmetry. I've put a negative sign out in front of the time component because of assumption 3 that our space-time surface is Lorentzian. So in conclusion, the most general form for the metric tensor solution to the Einstein field equations satisfying the assumptions required for the Schwarzschild solution is the following. B of R and A of R are functions that we ultimately have to solve for using the simplified vacuum Einstein field equations. Anyway, that should do it for this video. In the next lesson, I'm going to derive the Christoffel symbols for this onsatz and then the Ricci tensor components, which I'll use to solve the Einstein field equations for the Schwarzschild solution. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed this lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan, signing out.